And it is the Emissary Authors Podcast, uh, recording for uh, the future. So what you're listening to right now actually took place in the past, but I'm glad to say we're in the present. We haven't done this for a bit, and so it's good to be back uh, behind the mic here with my partner in crime, Jason Todd. Jason, great to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. I'm excited about today's author and guest, Corey Sexton, who is not only an author, but a, a pastor and a prolific writer. Yeah, and we're uh, this is this is an exciting time at Emissary. We have re- at, at the time of recording, we have released about four new titles. One of them by Corey. Uh, we have another one in the works from him. He is one of our prolific authors. Who uh, and and he he well ought to be because at the rate that he preaches at his church, uh, he creates enough content to fill several books every year. So let's let's bring Corey onto the show and get talking, Corey. So great to have you on the Emissary Authors Podcast. Welcome, my friend. Well, it's really good to be here today. I'm excited about this opportunity. And we're excited to have you. And uh, I should uh, pull down off the, off the uh, display shelf here and just hold it up for the, for the camera. You can't see this on the audio version, but this is Corey's book. It's called Your Church Needs You, Rediscover the Transformative Power of Serving Together. And we were very proud to help you put this together, Corey. And uh, I want to start off just for a little bit of background. Um, you know, this is uh, this is the incarnation or the uh, second incarnation, I guess you would say, of a book you originally wrote called Heroic Church Membership. And so, take us back a little bit into the the why, what really prompted that uh, to come out of you, and why you decided to make a book out of it. Well, I suppose the the impetus was just the church planting. Um, that we had accomplished here at Pushton Baptist Church. We planted this church, started with about 22 individuals, and we've been um, uh, plowing now for about 12 years and watching the church grow. And we've experienced just a number of needs along the way. And so for my 10th anniversary with the church, they gave me a sabbatical, and I needed it. I was little crunchy around the edges, you might say. I needed some rest. And uh, for that, uh, sabbatical, my wife and I planned to travel as many churches as we could and look at other churches that were doing things similar, but maybe on a larger scale or uh, more proficiently and try to learn from them. And in the process of that, uh, the Lord laid this thesis on my heart of, what does the church actually need and uh how does the church succeed and what is the role of the local church and i think it was just the outworking of 10 or 11 years of really hard working ministry and seeing other church movements that i felt like were uh possibly uh lending to uh the deterioration of what i believe is the local assembly and so in a matter of, I woke up one morning with a thesis on my heart. I went into my office, I typed the thesis, laid out the chapters, uh, brought that to my wife in a print form and said, what do you think about that? And she said, where did that come from? And I mm-hmm. came out of my head and she said, you should write that. And so for four weeks of my sabbatical, I wrote just almost every day, all day long. And at the end of the sabbatical, this book was, it was, it was ready to be, uh, looked at by other people and see, you know, what they thought about it. And so I started mm-hmm. pressing it around. So that's kind of where the book came from. It was just, um, an outworking of some of the struggles that we had been through in the church planting process. And it eventually, like you've, you've also preached this as a sermon, right? You, what you, what you write in the book has also become a sermon series that you did. I did. I actually, the first three weeks I was back from uh, my sabbatical, I broke this book down into a three sermon series on the church and um, preached that to uh, my church. Um, and and then from there, we were able to just kind of develop the program a little further. Mm. But it was it was well received by our church, and most of our people had experienced. Uh, the commitment and the conversion that I speak of in the book. And so, and they understood the need. They understand still today the need 
for help in the local assembly. Hmm. One of the things I want to draw out from what you're talking about is because I think it's applicable not only for your experience as a pastor and an author uh, for your community, but but I think is a is an applicable stru- uh, uh, storyline for for folks who are questioning whether they should write a book and what they should write about. You said, well, the Lord laid on my heart. And, and I want to look at that, that moment and offer you this opportunity teach us in that moment, Lord laid on my heart. How do you know that that's something that you should proceed down or, or if it's a bad burrito, you know, and it's going to pass. Yeah, I think, I think that may be a, a winding conversation, but, uh, for, for me, it was in that particular moment, it was. I dream the the book in its completion, and I'm not a dreams and signs and wonders guy, but it was to me it became very passionately a need to at least put it on paper. What would occur with it after that, I really didn't know. Um, as as is evident from the book, there are a number of pastors that read the book before we published it, and every time I handed it to one of them. My inner self said they're going to hate it, and 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 they're going to question this, that, or the other thing. And time after time, they came back and said, "Hey, this is really neat." So there was there was a process of affirmation that went along with the initial feeling that the Lord had put it on my heart. So you have this vision of completion. You can see how this whole thing comes together, uh, or that it will come together. It could come together, perhaps. Is a better way to say that without necessarily the path for how it might come together. And, but you felt this need, I have to uh, sort of memorialize this text. You then create this, you push it out of the universe and you start getting positive feedback, which is like you talked about a, uh, affirmative and a confirmation that yes, ever other people are feeling the same thing as well. That's, that's the loop. That yes, I would say so. And, and of course. I'm not, I'm not uh, blind to the fact that if I spent four weeks writing it and it never went anywhere, but my pulpit, it would, it would benefit my pulpit. Uh, as I've shared with you guys, I think there's, uh, some opportunity for this material to be used in new members classes or new believers classes. And so, and some of the things that I had done traveling to those other churches were specifically looking at their new membership process and their new believer process. And those pastors were kind enough to share information with me. So it wasn't an, uh, an act in futility. If I spent the time writing it, it would at least, it was an exercise for me and it would at least fit my ministry. Then the affirmation just made it more clear that it could be used on a wider scale. Yeah. So your book, your church needs you deals with this idea of membership, which is, I, you know, I, I look at my own experience because I know my experience the best, you know, I, I grew up in church and we had a membership, uh, and you knew who were, who were members and who were not members. The members had a, a, a directory every year. I think we had color pictures taken, which are really precious to look back on now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and members could vote. They had certain duties and responsibilities as members. Uh, and then, you know, throughout the years moved on to other churches, some of whom, you know, don't, ha- don't have the idea of membership. And it's more like, Hey, if you're just a, you know, general generic individual in this community, just show up to our, you know, our meeting once a year or twice a year and you have a voice. Walk us through this idea of church membership and why you feel that that's the, uh, sort of a, a turning point perhaps for people investing in a church or, or not. Yeah. And so, so I think that, I think that the book explains pretty clearly that what we are a member of is the body of Christ. And there is a local extension, so to speak, a local revelation of the body of Christ in the local church. And so we are really participating in our body position in Christ as a part of our salvation experience. 
but we're doing that at the local assembly level. What I think has driven, and and I think it was um, a part of again the thought process for me. If we if we jump over for a moment and think about a commercial application, many people would be cognizant of the Walmart effect. And back in the the late seventies and early eighties, when Walmart was becoming such an entity. It was a blessing to many small towns to receive a Walmart, but the blessings became somewhat of a curse because it would devour the local businesses of the town. There was no longer a need for them. And then suddenly everyone was dependent upon the Walmart. It sounds odd, the Walmart, uh, and the town was a ghost town. And we have seen that play out commercially in a number of ways. Today, I would say Amazon is doing the same thing, the retail packages, uh, by, by shipping everything. Well, in a similar effect, big box church applications have had a similar effect on small community churches so that the church is no longer the center of the community. Uh, and so the big boxes can do a lot of things the small guys cannot they can offer a professional level of entertainment, quality music. They, they offer child care, fully paid staff, all of these things, none of which are inherently wrong. But it draws the mass to that and it drains the life from the local assembly. And then the local assembly is not only left dealing with a diminishing membership uh, of attendance, but they're left with the diminishing workforce and no longer able to even provide what the church locally used to provide. And so this thing plays out in a number of ways, you know, and I talk about this in the book, we don't do funerals in the local church anymore. They, they all go to the funeral. Uh, that's something that we do here. It may, it may sound odd, but I want the church to be the center of our community. And so I, I don't insist, but I certainly request we do the funeral here at the church uh weddings don't do churches anymore they go to events when centers and and venues and and the church is no longer in the center of the individual's life used to and i'm dating myself a little bit but when the local church had vacation bible school they had a parade through the center of town and everybody was a part of that and the church was the spiritual center of the town and we've lost a lot of that. And I don't, I don't think that we've lost it gain. I think it's been an actual loss. Uh, and so that is, I apologize. That is where I see a lot of that need, uh, is if, if we could get involved in the local assembly again, as believers, fulfilling our position, that local assembly would be more robust and would be able to provide the opportunities that it once provided. So what I hear in this for, because I think there's some people who are going to come at this sort of message and say, hey, well, that's old school. You're living in the past. Yeah. You can't have these things back. Get with the progressive nature of the times. What, I, what I'm not hearing that from you. Instead, what I'm hearing is, listen, this idea of what, I love the idea of big box stores, right? You, what you gain in some respects you also has a sacrifice in another in another way. Sure. Uh, to your point of you know the church used to be the used to be the uh, the place you might go to for help. Like hey, if you're in need, you would say go to the church, talk to the church. And now it's like well you know go to this thing or go to this thing or go to that thing. And the idea of big box church, uh, we can go in and be relatively anonymous. Nobody needs to know us. Uh, and if that church doesn't work, we go to a different church and, you know, we hop around. So there's no continue, uh, a continuum of storyline for ourselves to be known by other community members. And like you say, it's not inherently bad, but it is how much is lost because we, we become this sort of homogenous, uh, church experience rather than the 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 um unique the sort of the unique church experience of a smaller 
community of people who know each other and have done life with each other. Yes. That, that I feel is what you're, you're advocating for what's being lost and how, what, uh, what can be gained if we, if we bring that back. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's the idea. I, I don't, I don't begrudge any of the other models. I don't begrudge someone being involved in those, but you know, they call them the good old days for a reason. They were good. And there's a lot of those things that we've lost. And we haven't lost it to the extent that we sit around and mourn and bemoan our pitiful condition. But at the same time, we think back on those days and, uh, you know, something really macabre that happens in my ministry a lot, the local funeral home that contacts me on a regular basis to do funerals for somebody I've never met. Mm. And I go in and talk to their family and they have. They have a, a history in the church. They have a history with this, that, or the other, but the church is such a large venue. There is no personal connection and there's no pastoral connection. And I feel like most things are important. Um, true enough, they may not be important for everyone, but I think they are important nonetheless. Or they may, um, Th those those individuals may not have come to a time in their lives when it when they re really really had to face the importance. So sure. to your point about the idea of you know, uh, uh, it, are there funerals in churches? Well, if if we begin life, let's say in church like we used to, you know, uh, you know somebody would celebrate a new baby or whatever, and there are baby dedications, and some people sure. do baby baptisms, and that's fine. So the we begin life. And then we begin perhaps a new life by getting married in a church, a together life. And then, and then we have our end of life all centered around this transcendent or supernatural aspect of our being. Right. Um, isn't, I, I agree with you. I think there is a, there is a, there is much to be lost by not, um, not bringing that to the church not doing that in community with the other church, the other people who know us in that sort of supernatural sense, rather than just, Hey, I know him through his job or, you know, I know them because, you know, apparently they've been coming to, you know, our multi-thousand person church, you know, for the past six months, <laughs> uh, which again, you know, they have, there's a certain reach that's available for that, but at the, where there's, where there's a, a wide reach, sometimes the, you know, that personal nature, that personal attendance is lost. And eventually you need to, I, I think a person who's not personally attached to other folks, a person who's not known, that person suffers the most. Yes. No, I agree with you completely. I think it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a wholesomeness in it. Um, and we've seen a lot of young families come back to that. They, and they'll come from the big box and, and there's always a sort of a sentiment of, I want my children to experience in church, what I experienced in church growing up. And that's, that's available at the local assembly. That's where that happens. But if we continue to siphon off hill from the local assembly, it will continue to denigrate and eventually be swallowed up. And then uh, we'll all be saying, whatever happened to Wilson's five and dime? Well, it went the way of Walmart. And well, hey, what happened to that local church that was over there? Well, it went the way of you, you insert the name. Yeah. yeah. That's the burden that, that the Lord has put on my heart. So, so now that we know a little bit about that, Corey, you talk about the value of an individual's participation to the local church and you call it the body position. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that, you know, especially like in contrast to say you go and offer your, your gifts and talents in a much larger church and in, in a, a box store version of that, what do you, what are you seeing on the ground leading a small congregation, um, that is turning out differently, uh, and, and creating a lot more value than people might think looking from the outside. 
So I, I think that what we see in the smaller congregations, um, and that's a, that's a spectrum number, by the way, because a small congregation may be 20 or 30. Uh, it may be 250. Uh, if you look at a Southern Baptist average across the nation, 150 is a median range for a church size. So there's a lot of those churches there. I think what we see, though, is opportunities that might not be afforded otherwise. Uh, I think, it, you know, it's a, a relative comparison might be uh, to the high school athlete uh, who is in an eight or seven, a power program and he's undersized, but he's got the heart of Rudy or the heart of Rocky. Uh, he may need to go to a three, a school or a one, a school to get the exposure to express himself because there's too much the other place. There's a similar effect in a smaller congregation where that we just had a young lady, uh, Sunday morning, she's 14. Uh, she's relatively shy, uh, but she has been training with the choir and she wanted to sing a special and she was able to do that alone in front of the church of about 130 folks in attendance Sunday morning. Um, and she really shined in that moment and it was really good. It was impressive. and It was good for her. Uh, I don't think you get that opportunity when there's 5,000 people there or a thousand for that matter. Um, I don't even think she would attempt in that environment. So that's one aspect of it. The opportunity to express yourself. Uh, the other side, I think, is the perpetuation of that thing that you grew up and having your kids experience that. You know, uh, when I was a, a child, there was one lady in our church. Her name was Miss Spence. She always had juicy fruit go. Back then it was called zebra stripe. And I would lay uh, in the pew and she, she was not my mother, my aunt. I cut. She was just a lady in the church, big haired lady in the church. And uh, lay there in her lap and chew that gum and she would scratch my back. And it was, she was like the grandmother I didn't get to experience in many ways. And our kids in, in this particular facility have that relationship. Uh, and I think that's something that you see a benefit of. And then the, the lastly, and we'll move on to something else if you prefer, I think the opportunity to begin and finish something for the individual that I'm going to get involved. I'm going to be a part of this program. And I'm going to run this program to its finality. Mm. And I think that that not only helps. Uh, on the, the psychological side of living, but it also develops the spiritual side of living. And there's a certain spiritual maturity that comes out of it, which is, in the end, discipleship and a goal or a chart. I like um, the emphasis you put there on what I would, how I would describe it as the quality of the engagement. Mm -hmm. So like if you're participating in a small, s smaller local church, shall we say, there's an opportunity to serve, in you know, there's an abundant, there's always an abundance of opportunities to serve, but you also are just, you just have a much greater, shall we say, statistical chance of building a relationship that transcends the Sunday encounter. And I think, you know, um, in, in my family's case, having been to a number of large churches and because of our geography right now, the one that we attend is pretty large. Um, it's very easy to be, uh, the, you know, the church hello type of people, you know, you just say hello on Sunday and that's about it. And yeah. there's not much beyond that because there's, and even if you serve, even if you show up regularly, um, people don't, people don't really know who you are or they don't remember who you are much harder to make yourself memorable without being a superstar. You know, now if you, if you have the gifts of a, you know, 
a national celebrity pop singer and you get up there and you lead worship, then you're going to be memorable. But that's few and far between, even in a church full of thousands of people. Yes, absolutely. So uh, there's another topic that you that you point out in this in this great book of yours, and it strikes me because I remember going to a, a smaller church, about maybe 80 people, and I think I led music there for a, a, a number of years. And I remember that another larger church came into town. And they have this whole tagline about how they're doing church differently and whatnot. And the, the, the smaller churches kind of rebuffed this idea. Like we need to, uh, we need to be a little more free. Like this other church is pretty programmed. They got their stuff going on and, uh, and it, and it almost became a us and them thing Mm -hmm. where it was like, they're doing the church and pushing out the spirit. And then, you know, we're, we're all the spirit and, you know, if we uh, want to spin on a dime, you know, in the last half of that service and cut it short, because that's what the spirit says, then we should do that. And you've, you're talking about this idea of programming and how I think you put it as uh, church programming is not heresy. Yes. Right. So walk us, walk us through how you unpack that in your book. Well, and, and I think that that is probably aimed in the opposite direction than maybe it is perceived. Um, sometimes in the, in the, uh, certain, um, sets of, uh, that's S C C T S of religious and religiosity and denominational beliefs, you get into this idea where you can't have any kind of a order of service. If you've got an order of service, you just squelt the spirit, you know, and, and you've, you're, it's all of man. And so we, we are programmed to the extent that you know, we have a devotion focus that is, that is of a catechism. I can, our people can tell you how many songs they're going to be, uh, how many choir songs they're going to be, when the special is going to be, how long the sermon is going to be. Uh, they know those things and we're pretty, we start on time and, and we quit when we're finished. Uh, and so, uh, all of those things occur, but they are to an end of discipleship. We are trying to have a robust program of teaching, whether that be Sunday school or Bible fellowship, whichever you prefer to call it, Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening worship, Wednesday evening Bible study. There is a full slate there. And in the book, I talk about, uh, if you. If you went to the local restaurant, but you only ever went for breakfast and you went, uh, once a week for breakfast to this restaurant. And then after a few months, someone said to you, well, how's that restaurant over there? You might would say, well, it's pretty good, but they don't serve anything but breakfast. Well, that's not true. And they serve all kinds of things. You're just never there to enjoy the fullness of the menu. And so when we think about church attendance and church participation, that is what I'm saying is to be there to enjoy the fullness of the menu. Now, if you happen to be in a church where, uh, the pulpit is slipshod, if you want to use a different word, I don't know, there's no programming, there's no planning, then I don't know exactly what to tell you. I, I know what I would say, but I don't want to say it and hurt anybody's feelings. But there ought to be an intentional growth, uh, an intentional discipleship, an intentional teaching. And I can tell you for 12 months what I'm preaching. Uh, now, that's something relatively new for me, uh, the 12-month aspect, but it's always been quarterly because I'm working towards that goal of growing my individuals in biblical knowledge. And the Bible would say, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that's where I think programming is important. I think if if we get into this idea where we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants, the needful things probably are what gets left out. That's a good point. I, the, uh, the example that comes to my mind is, uh, my two oldest, well, my only sons, but my two oldest kids, both boys one year and six days apart. So they're almost like twins as they're growing up. 
However, they had remarkably different personalities and they were different academically as well. And so the older one went to a public school into what they call their gifted program or whatever. Uh, and it, and it was very intense academically and the nature of the kids in that program, you, you kind of knew when a person was in that program. Now, my second son, he's coming up through the high school ranks and the, the thought was, okay, well, should he go to this public school or should he stay with, uh, the private school that he was attending in the grade school? With? And we were weighing this and determined that he needed to stay in this private school, a uh, high school that we could put him in because it was the best for his overall growth personally, you know, with his, with the social development, I thought that was very important for him, uh, because he was more inclined. He had certain inclinations to go, you know, to maybe go with friend groups. And so we wanted to protect the social structure primarily and the academics were totally fine. And he's, he wasn't, uh, as academically gifted as, as our oldest. So in that I, I look at the, cause you're talking about, you know, the church family having, having the ability and in my case, there are the responsibilities of dad to know my boys individually and know what one needs and one, what doesn't and what one doesn't need. And then sometimes present them with opportunities for their own personal development sure. has to be a small issue. It's got to be a tight knit issue. You have to know one another. And it's not that, you know, back to this idea of the book, it's not that, uh, you, that you can't get that perhaps in a larger church, but you're not going to get it with, but larger churches talk about those issues. They're like, Hey, how do we do discipleship when we're when all it is is on Sunday morning and they're constantly trying to press down into discipleship. And then the smaller churches have the one up on discipleship and knowing people individually right. and sometimes press, well, yeah, but our music isn't, you know, as good and our lighting isn't as good. Right. So it, it is interesting that it's not one, you know, it's not necessarily one or the other, but know what's being lost. And, and I'm, I'm just curious where, where do you, where do you connect with, uh, that, that just those, those thoughts and then tie us back into your book. Yeah. And so, so I, I agree with what you said. I think that there's a much more, uh, individualized capability. What you'll hear oftentimes in large church mentality is how do we stay small? That, and so they stay small through small groups or through Bible fellowship or through men's groups. That's how they stay small. And so what they're saying is, how do we remain personally connected to our people? And then you have this multiplicity of leadership that you have a hard time duplicating the right kind of leadership. And so further you get away from the root, you know, it gets, gets, a, gets a little dicey. Where in a small church environment, and, and, and not even a small church, but a, a discipleship-oriented church environment, we are able to offer niches. So... We just completed, for example, we just completed an 11 week series at Esther on Sunday nights and we were all together for that. But while that was going on, I had a four man group led by one of my, uh, one of my younger men studying tactics, the book of tactics, how to share your Christianity. They were in a sub group by themselves. And so, and then, uh, we'll do this again in August. I've got one of my associates will be teaching some doctrinal things in the sanctuary, and I'll be leading a group of six married couples through uh, some uh, Christian marriage insight stuff. Uh, and there's a number of different programs we'll use for that. So we're able to break out those groups, and it's still in the life of the church. I think the larger you get, or the more uh, performance oriented you get, the harder that becomes. For example, if you're not, if you're an organization that's offering five or six worship opportunities between Thursday night and Sunday afternoon, so that you can appeal to a multiple or multiplicity of schedules, those people are coming basically 
for a concert with an encouraged recipe. There's no real discipleship interaction happening. Right. When that occurs, the other programs. So, well, I think it gets to I think the subtitle of this uh, re-release of of this book. So, the your church needs you rediscovering the power, uh, the transformative power of serving together, sure. and and I it, it recalls to my mind this I, this idea of you no know, you don't really know something until you can teach it, right? And the the this idea of service rather than consumption. So investment or consumption, I think those are kind of maybe the two, two ends of that scale. How, how often do people serve in the church nowadays in a larger church versus a smaller church where the needs are very clearly seen? My place, my ability to make an impact is very clearly seen. And so it's worth it to me to put together, you know, to put that investment into nur the nursery or the you know, or teaching or something like that, because I can see that I make a difference. Uh, how have you dealt with that in the book, this idea of service and the benefits of that versus maybe the more consumer uh, oriented? Well, in, in, the, in the book, and this is not original, but I do mention the, the cruise ship mentality. That's something that you'll read out there. And, and that, that has infected a lot of churches and we're trying to break away from a cruise ship mentality more to training center, um, or, um, uh, an infantry type thing where everybody is involved, everyone is included. And, uh, we've had relative success at that. And, and I'm in a network of churches that are doing what we're doing. Uh, we certainly are not, um, we're not pioneers in that area. We are just adherents to a particular belief. And, uh, and so. What you see there, though, is you see those people get involved and the commitment makes a difference in their life and it grows them spiritually and they see it bleed over into their family health, into the health of their children spiritually. And we see, we've now even got, with 12 years in, I've got some second generations coming along that were, you know, 10, 11 years old when this thing started. And uh, my children's director was 14 years old when we planted this church. And she is now the mother of two and directing my children's program. She's absolutely brilliant. And uh, we've watched all of that take place in a small church atmosphere with her being discipled one on and And she's not alone. We've got others doing that. And I think that there's more opportunity for that in this form of church model. So to bring this in for a landing, Corey, let's give our listening and viewing audience um, the practical. And, and, and my mind wants to go to what you talk about when you say the power of commitment and how one small commitment can change everything. You tell a story in the book, and I don't know if you want to use that one or you just want to use a, a story of uh, like the one you just did. But something shifts and people go from the cruise ship or the, you know, like you've talked about in the book, the, the, the renter mentality to the owner mentality. Like this is my faith. This is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. So let's just walk us through that a little bit to, to bring it in for a landing and, uh, to show people what they can do from here, uh, once they've heard this and once they've read your book. I absolutely, I, I, I believe that commitment is the key to the entire issue uh, and I think the problem with commitment is sometimes we commit too much at one time and we try to overcommit. We try to commit things that we're not capable of committing. Uh, in the book, I tell the story of our re-engagement with the church. Uh, we were both, my wife and I were both raised in church. Um, both were opened the idea of church, but we weren't involved. And when we became involved in our early thirties, 31 years old, the commitment I made was we're not going to miss any more church. I didn't think I had any other gifts and abilities to offer for various testimonial reasons. Uh, but that was the commitment. That was the only thing I knew I could control. And that was the commitment I made. And it was revolutionary in our life. Uh, I, I tell people often my, my youngest is, uh, my son and he was a, a really talented athlete, a really talented football player, but he's a big fella. And, uh, he, uh, played ball at about 
six foot, 285, 295. He was a big kid. And he, every year, he would decide that he was going to get in shape for baseball season. And this boy, who was a great athlete, but preferred to play video games and eat Twinkies and sleep late, he would suddenly say, Natum, get up in the morning and go run five miles. And every time I do, he's not going to run five miles. He's probably going to run to the bottom of the driveway and back. And every time there would be this major disappointment within himself because he had made this grand plan of commitment and he could not follow through with it. I see it all do the same thing all the time. Make the commitment that you can keep. Yeah. God work in the rest of it. And that's how the Lord worked in our life. I love it because it's just, you know, it, it, I think, I, th I think you're right. I think most of the time people say, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've now I've got to make, I've got to be at every service and I've got to serve in six different ministries and I've got to do all this. And no, 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 not at all. You got to change one little thing, right? Because when you change one little thing, it starts to bleed over into other things Yes, that also change for the better. You, you just become sort of hooked in a good way on the progress and the growth that's available there. I think trajectory may be the right word there, huh? Might well be. <laughs> well, this has been an exciting interview of uh, one of our newest emissary authors on the show, Corey Sexton. His book is Your Church Needs You, Rediscover the Transformative Power of Serving Together. Available everywhere fine books are sold, but most especially uh, on our website, publishwithemissary.com forward slash Corey dash Sexton. And uh, we will be looking forward to seeing how this turns out for you, Corey. Any final words you want to contribute for the good of the order? I, I do just want to say thanks to Emissary and the work you guys are doing. It's a blessing to us. And we're, we're, we're really pleased and uh, excited about what the future holds. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for this edition of the Emissary Authors Podcast. Our guest is Corey Sexton, my co-host Jason Todd, and myself, Paul Edwards. We will look forward to seeing you next time.